It is good to see y'all here today. Thank you for coming and choosing to worship with us, the Franklin Baptist Church. Good to have visitors with us today, and uh, we're going to be baptizing today. That's always exciting as well, and uh, and so it's good to see y'all here. I know we have several that are sick, several that can't be here. I'll mention this really quickly here, but please pray uh, for Robert and Brenda Coffey. They've got a brand new grandbaby. Uh, if you're here in the Sunday School Hour, I shared that, and... and um, and I can't remember the name or the, hold on a second, I'm terrible at these kind of things. And uh, But I did write it down. Give me a second. Gregory Tate Lansaw, 6 pounds, 10 ounces, born 1237 this morning. And so uh, so pray for uh, Kurt and Rachel, that's uh, uh, the parents, but pray for Robert Brenna Coffey, the grandparents as well. And so several that can't be here, my dad's under the weather, uh, Jeannie Gross is still under the weather, some other folks are still sick, but I'm glad that you are here. Uh, we're going to sing and praise the Lord and work. Worship Him together today. Right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask Him to bless our service and our time here together with heads bowed and eyes closed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us. Thank You for Jesus who died to save us from our sins. Thank You for the privilege that we have of being a part of Your church and a part of Your work. And I just pray that today, dear Lord, our lives, our singing, our giving, the preaching of Your Word would glorify and honor You, dear Lord. And I pray that each of us, dear Heavenly Father, right now begin to open up our ears and our minds and our hearts to let you speak to us, dear Lord. Help us, I pray, to be open to letting you work and move in our lives. And I pray as you convict and as you challenge us, dear Lord, we just yield ourselves to your perfect will. And I pray to Heavenly Father that even today, if there's one that's never invited Jesus Christ into their life to be their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be that day of salvation. But I pray that today, dear Heavenly Father, your will would be done in each heart and life that's here, and that you'd be glorified and honored. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I am uh, so, so thankful for our praise team. And uh, we're going to start off. They're going to start us off with a song. And, uh, and so you give them your undivided attention as they sing for us. We pray, unveil why we're 
morning. Uh, go ahead and please stand, if you will, as we uh, sing our first song, hymn number 575, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. number 630, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Christ forsake me, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield me, thou wilt find a solace there. This, of course, is our mission month here. The month of September is our mission emphasis month. And um, our theme there, you see it around the building and on the screen there, Bridging the Gap. Our theme verse is Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, Go ye unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's God's command to us as a church and as Christians to preach the gospel to every creature. And, uh, and I'm so thrilled. We've got several missionaries that will be with us throughout the month. And we've had uh, some missionaries back in July. We've got another one coming in October. Unfortunately, we couldn't get a missionary for every Sunday. Uh, but I want to take just a, a moment here and just remind you here of our flags. And uh, we usually put the flags up during Mission Emphasis Month just to remind you not of a... Uh, political uh, group or a, or, 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 a, or a nation per se as, as we understand it, but we use the flags to represent people and, and, and the people in that region in which they live. And many of y'all may not be aware, but, but we, we of course didn't have enough uh, missionaries here to, uh, this month to, to have six flags up. But with, just with the missionaries that we had in July, those that we're going to be having in September, we put up some extra flags, and uh, and I find it interesting, too, um, the missionaries that God has brought our way. And if you'll just bear with me just for a moment, on the far right, uh, the flag on my right, your left, is the flag to Zambia. We were able to have Kyle and Emily Kerr with us in, uh, in, in July. They're going to Zambia, Africa. Uh, the flag in the middle here on your left is the flag to Palau. And we're going to be having Andrew McClure with us and his family next month. Uh, the next flag, you might recognize that one. Uh, that's the Ohio flag. That's because uh, here on Wednesday, we've got a special missionary guest. Brad Kleppitz is a missionary uh, to Ohio. He's starting a church up in Tip City. He's one of our Lamplighter uh, pastors. And if you support Lamplighters, you help support Brad Kleppitz. And he's a missionary right here at home. And uh, we always try to support uh, local uh, missionaries in the States as well as those around the world because the U.S. is still a mission field as well. On my left, your right, the first flag there is the flag of Ukraine. Of course, we had Misha Dean with us here uh, a short while ago as well. She's one of the missionaries we've been supporting for years. Uh, the flag there in the middle is, is the flag of Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is a nation in, in Africa. And at the end of this month, we're going to have Robert Canfield with us. And uh, he's starting a very unique, I don't want to get too much into it because I want him to be able to share it. He can share it better than I can. But a unique radio ministry uh, trying to get um, uh, God's word preached and instruction given to Christians uh, from people in their native tongues. And, and, and so the work that he's doing, it's going to be a radio work. It's going to begin there in Burkina Faso. And that's Robert Canfield. And then the last flag there is the flag of Botswana. And uh, if y'all were here last week, you met Summer Scroggs. She had a great presentation and, and uh, God's burdened her heart to go to Africa as well and and so uh, so these are the, the the six nations that are represented in the missionaries that we're sending out and or that we are having in our church uh, here over this uh, mission emphasis time period and, and I find it interesting three of these are to Africa and, and there are many, it seems like so many missionaries right now are looking to go into Africa. So many parts of the world are closed. It's very hard to get into China, almost impossible. The Middle East, as a missionary, you can't go to the Middle East and claim to be a missionary. You will not be allowed in to most of the Middle Eastern countries. Um, but, uh, but those areas that are open, those, those areas that will allow us to go in, we want to get the gospel to those areas, certainly in these African nations. Uh, and I'm excited about that. I'm excited about Misha Dean. If you were here when Misha was here, being in the Ukraine right now, and she can't be in the Ukraine full time because of the violence going on there. But I'm excited to have a part in a work that's going on in that area, in that region. And she still has an impact, even though she's not there on the field, she still has an impact there, as well as uh, uh, the, the nation of Palau. And, and right here at home, 
And so I just wanted to just take a moment and remind you when the Bible tells us in Mark 16, 15, to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that is a huge responsibility. But I'm excited when we have an opportunity to send missionaries out into as many parts of this world as we can, to as many uh, of much of, of God's creation as we possibly can. And so I, I hope and I hope that you would be praying for our missionaries, those that we've had come in and those that are still going to be coming in. Be praying for our church, uh, these missionaries that we do not currently support. And most of these missionaries that we've talked about, we don't support them. I'd love, I think, I'd love to take these missionaries on uh, here very soon as well and, and get the gospel out into more parts of this world. And so you do your part. You pray. Our last song was, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Give our burdens to Christ. Pray to him let's pray let's pray hard uh, for our missionaries let's pray hard uh, for our church that we'd have a burden for missions that we'd be able to give more and go more and pray more and and so you pray and you do your part and it starts with prayer uh, but then there has to be the going as well and, and so you do your part to bridge the gap between God's world word and a lost world and it starts with prayer but it goes with you sharing and you giving as well but let's be a part of reaching all of these nations for the cause of Christ and many, many more. And, and of course, we're able to, to reach out to these nations. The, the real bridge for that gap is the cross of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died for us, that gives us access to God. And, and we're going to sing now. And now it's going to lead us in, in, in the old hymn, the old rugged cross. And, uh, and, and thank God for Jesus Christ and his gift for us on Calvary. Alec, come and lead us to the next one. If you'll go ahead and stand again as we turn to hymn number 327, The Old Rugged Cross.
wants to go ahead and start making their way back to their seats. Uh, you can be seated for this last song, hymn number 343, Amazing Grace. make their way forward let me encourage you to take part in this portion of the worship service as we give back to God as he has blessed us and and, uh, and so at this time we give our tithes and our offerings and and just continue to give this is part of, of uh, how we keep the lights on the doors open but it's also how we send missionaries out around the world into places uh, like the Ukraine and Zambia and Botswana and, and around the world and so you give as God has blessed you be faithful in your tithes give to faith promise missions giving as well well, but let the, Lord, let the Lord use you as a vessel and an instrument here as we worship Him with heads bowed and eyes closed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus who died to save us. And thank you for the privilege that we have of being a part of your work. And help us, dear Lord, today to give an obedience to you as you lead uh, us, as we as you lay on our hearts. Help us to give, dear Lord. Help us to give uh, cheerfully. Help us to give, dear Lord, and worship to you. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, you take and use these offerings just to be a blessing and, and, and to work and, and move it and seeing souls saved and decisions made here in Franklin and around the world, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to be good stewards of it, even as you bless and use it, dear Heavenly Father. And I pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. This past Monday, uh, my wife and, and I and, and, and our daughter Victoria were just out doing some running around, and, and um, we were up by the Fairfield Mall up in that area. We were turning to get onto the interstate, and all of a sudden we heard a thumping, a banging in the back of the vehicle. And immediately I pulled over onto the shoulder there. I was just on the entrance ramp to the interstate. And immediately I pulled over to see what was wrong. And, and to my daughter, it sounded like it was right behind her inside the vehicle. Uh, but that didn't make much sense to me. And so I went out and I looked. And, and if you all see the picture there, I found a drill bit in the side of my tire. Now that tire is inside my vehicle there. It's not on the car at this point. But this is the drill bit that I found in my tire. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll take bids if uh, y'all are interested. I don't know that it's going to, uh, it's been banged around pretty good, but it's an interesting little vicious looking uh, tool right there. But uh, this was jabbed into my tire. And of course, what that meant is that we could no longer proceed. We had to stop everything we were doing. Um, theoretically, I guess I could have continued to drive with this in my tire. My, of course, the, the tire was rapidly losing air, and uh, and I would have, of course, just, of course, the tire was already destroyed. But I would have probably destroyed my rims and and wheel and and just done a great deal more damage. So I I had to stop. I had, could no longer proceed. I think sometimes in life we look at the problems ahead of us, and we say I can no longer proceed. We look at the issues of this life and we say, I can only go this far and no further. We look at the issues of this life and there is, if you want to say that there is a gap in the road, there is a cliff we cannot cross. We can go no further. I think spiritually sometimes we get to this point in our lives, unfortunately, where we think to ourselves that, that you know, I've, I've done all I can do and I can do no more. Or, or the problems are too big and, and it may be personal problems and maybe certainly the world's problems are, are certainly an issue today. And we might just put the brakes on everything and stop and say, I can go no further. We look at the world today and we say, boy, we're living in the last times. And, and people don't, you know, they don't want to hear the gospel anymore. We're living in the last times and, and young people don't want to come to church anymore. We're living in the last times and, and we can list all the problems and all the issues and, and, and we can say, well, it's just there's no point. But I believe this and I want to ask you today, do you believe that God can still do miracles? Do you believe that God can still save souls? Do you think that God can still bring revival today? If we believe it, we need to act on it. We've got a calling and a commission. Of course, our, our, our mission theme this year is bridging the gap. There is a gap. There is an obstacle. There is problems. There are, there are issues that we cannot easily overcome. It, it, it's just the reality of the world in which we live. But we have a responsibility to bridge that gap. And I've said it many times already and in our this month, and, and you know, the, the gap is, is between God's word and the world in which we live. There's a huge gap. And that gap, it does consist of real problems and real pain and real obstacles. And we can look at this and we can say, I can't go on, I can't go forward. But let me tell you today, God can still do miracles. God can still save souls. God can still bring revival. God can still work in the hearts and lives of young people as well as old people. God's not done yet, and we shouldn't be done either. When we come here to our text in, in the book of Acts, and I encourage you to turn there in Acts chapter number 16, what we find is two missionaries. Paul and Silas, this is a passage we're very familiar with. I've preached on this passage before. It's not going to be anything new to most of y'all. When we come to Acts chapter number 16, we find that, that, that two missionaries have hit a huge obstacle. There is a big gap before them. And it would be easy to quit. It would be easy to get discouraged. And the truth of the matter is that I believe we're living in the last days. And the Bible promises us in 2 Timothy 3.1, in the last days, 
perilous time shall come. The Bible tells in 2 Timothy 3.12, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There will be problems. There will be obstacles. There will be pain. There, there will be excuses and reasons to stop. But I believe that God is bigger than our problems. I believe when we look at the gap before us between God's Word and the world, I look at that gap and I look at the problem and I look at the, the difficulty of getting God's message to a lost and dying world. Can I tell you something? God has the solutions. God can still work and use us and God can still use His church today. I started off talking about my car. Before we get to our text here, I told you I had to stop. I could not go any further. I, I had a big, massive chunk of metal in my tire. But you want to know something? This may surprise you. My car is still not still sitting up there on the side of the road. As a matter of fact, that very day, I was able to get my car on the road again. I didn't mean to mention the song, by the way, but... Uh, <laughs> Of all the songs that I could have accidentally shared the lyrics to. My car got back on the road. The problem was there. The problem had to be dealt with. But I'll tell you something, folks. Praise the Lord. I had a spare tire. Praise the Lord. I was able, unfortunately, I didn't have one of my boys there to go out there and change it for me. I had to go do it myself. But I praise the Lord. We got back on the road. And you're going to encounter problems. You're going to encounter persecution. You're going to encounter perilous times. You're going to encounter problems. And you may have to stop and, and sort it out and deal with it. But God is not done. And God will see us through. In our Bibles in Acts chapter number 16, we're going to begin in verse number 16 today. And, and, and these first several verses are just kind of going to kind of lay out the problem. And I know many of you all are familiar with this. But in Acts chapter 16, in verse number 16... And there came to pass, as we went to pray, and this is this missionary team, including Paul and Silas, as we went to pray, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. And this you might say, well, that's a good thing. This, this, this child was demon-possessed, and, and, and he cast out that spirit. And, and, but unfortunately, not everybody sees it that way. In verse number 19, when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together with them, and the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Safely, Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. All of a sudden, the brakes are on the ministry. All of a sudden, they, have, they cannot go any further. What they had planned is now done. Their next day, their ne next day that they had, had organized and, and planned out, those, all those plans were canceled. As a matter of fact, they were beyond the ability to make any plans for the ministry. Their ministry, you could easily say, was finished. Their ministry was done. They might as well quit. There's, there's nothing else for them to do. They've been arrested. They've been beaten. They've been cast into prison. And they're made fast in these stocks. They're chained up and bound up in this prison. There is nothing that they can do for Christ. Or is there? Or is there? You might say, I'm done. There's nothing I can do. I can't get involved. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I'm stuck. And, and it's just time to quit. The problems, my problems are too big. The, the world's problems are too big. Can I tell you something? In the midst of our adversity, we can have a ministry. When the world tries to pump the brakes on what we're doing, when the devil tries to stop our progress... 
when our problems, our pain, our own mistakes prevent us from moving forward, it doesn't mean that God is done. God's bigger than our problems. Let me ask you here. Let's pray. Join me as we pray. And as I pray aloud, I want you to pray quietly that God would show you in the midst of your adversity. And I, I know personally some of y'all are facing adversity today. I know, I know what some of y'all's adversity is. And many of y'all have problems that I have no idea about. But let's begin to pray right now that God would show each of us in the midst of our adversity, in the midst of, midst of what we see as obstacles, that God would show us what we can do next. Because God's not done. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Paul and Silas, their faithfulness in sharing your word, dear Lord. And thank you for recording for us the problems that they faced, dear Heavenly Father. Much, much bigger problems than many of us are dealing with, dear Lord. But I pray that today as we examine the problems of Paul and Silas and we examine their faithfulness and we examine your goodness, dear Lord, that it would just encourage us and strengthen us, dear Lord, in the midst of the pain and difficulty that we're facing, not to quit and not to give up, dear Lord, but to be what you would have us to be, to let you work and move it into our lives, dear Lord. And I just pray to Heavenly Father that our church and each individual that's here and every person in the sound of my voice, dear Lord, would be challenged and encouraged with your word today and that we just might leave this place, dear Lord, and moving forward, spiritually moving forward, mission-minded, dear Lord, moving forward and seeing souls saved and lives changed. And I pray today, dear Lord, you do a work of revival right here in our hearts and lives in this church building. And that your will be accomplished. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me share with you here what Paul and Silas do. I know many of y'all are familiar with this. You already know what's going to happen next. But, but I think it's so important that we come back and examine this. Certainly during our missions month. Certainly as we look, if you will, at the end times. And, and we don't know what's going to happen next in this world. But I do know this. There will be problems ahead. It's been said before, you know, if, if, hey, listen, if, if you're not in the midst of a problem, you're either just coming out of a problem or about to go into a problem. We're going to have problems. We're going to have trials. We're going to have hardship. And here's a beautiful thing, and I love this. This is one of the most powerful thoughts we find in Scripture dealing with adversity. For Paul and Silas, they've been arrested, falsely accused. They've been beaten. They've been locked up in the jail cell. And then look at what they do in verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Here they are locked up in jail. Here they are bound in chains. Here they are beaten. They're hurting. They're sore. I, I'll bet you they're awake at midnight because they probably can't get comfortable. They've had many stripes laid on their back. They probably can't get comfortable enough to be able to fall asleep. And yet, they, and instead of groaning, instead of complaining, instead of griping, that's second nature for us, isn't it? And, you know, to talk about our pain and problems and our aches and, and our misery and, and, and to get angry at other people and to get angry at circumstances, instead of doing all that, they stop and they praise God and they sing praises to Him. I'm so thankful that people are willing to sit up and sing and praise God in dark times because that's when we need the songs the most. It's easy to sing. It's easy to sing when the sun's shining and, and, and we got money on the, the money in the bank and, 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 and our bellies are full and, and everything's right in the world and it's easy to sing. But I'll tell you what, when we need the songs of praise to God, it's when things are the darkest and the hardest. And what we have right here is a hopeless situation. What Paul and Silas had intended to do, they could no longer do. They could not do from a jail cell what they had intended to do in this city. But it didn't mean they could do nothing. It didn't mean they were unable to serve. It didn't mean they were unable to be of use to God. And I see people, I encounter people, and I know I, we've, got, we've got some older people in our church, and, 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 and there's people in our church now, they, they used to be able to maybe sing in the choir, they used to be able to, to maybe teach a class, they used to be able to, to go out on visitation, they used to be able to do things. They physically can't do all those things anymore. I get that. That doesn't mean God's done with you. That doesn't mean God doesn't have a purpose and a plan for you. That doesn't mean that God's not going to use you right here and now. Maybe you can't do everything you used to do, but God can use you where you're at and what you're going through. And here's why. Here's what they did. They remembered who they were serving first and foremost. 
They had somebody to praise. They sang praises unto God. They prayed unto God. The ministry that they were involved in was not about them. The, the, the ministry wasn't there to make them feel good and satisfied. It was to give God glory. Because I guarantee you, the last thing in the world that, that Paul and Silas were doing were, were patting themselves on the back for a job well done that night. In all honesty, they were probably thinking, boy, we really messed this up. Boy, we don't have this. I, I don't know what. I don't know how we're going to start a church in the city of Philippi now. The people hate us. We're in jail. We're in prison. They beat us up. I'm sure what they thought they were supposed to do, they thought it was at an end. But they weren't doing it just to fulfill a plan written down on a piece of paper. And they weren't doing it just to make themselves satisfied or happy. And, and listen, they weren't even doing it just for the people of Philippi. Their service was to God. First and foremost and primarily. In Matthew 22, and, and listen, in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, Jesus is approached and He's asked this very important question. Master, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now let's pause for a moment. What is God's greatest commandment for you? Is it to teach Sunday school class? Is it to sing in the choir? What's God's greatest commandment for you and for me today? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. God's greatest desire and plan and will for you is to love Him. It's to look to Him. And then secondary, and, and he says, and the second is like unto this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Bible's clear and Jesus is clear. Our greatest commandment, God's greatest will and plan for us is to love Him. And there may be times where our plans, boy, the brakes get put on our plans or on what we think we should do or what we've been doing. God may put the brakes on that, but it doesn't mean we can't still love God. We can't still pray. We can't still sing praises to Him. The world changes. Our lives change as much as we hate it. You know, there, I, my, the, the, the time frame that I have been in the ministry, I've been pastoring, it'll be, this December, it'll be 20 years that I've been a pastor. And in the ministry, seven or eight years before that as youth and associate pastor. And then four years of Bible college before that. And I think about all those years, <laughs> this world has changed. The attitude towards church has changed. The attitude towards Christianity is different now. And, and I've changed. <laughs> There's some parts of me which I could go back when I was 20 physically I wish I could go back to when I was 20 amen anybody else feel that way feeling the years creep up on you but I'll be honest with you spiritually mentally I don't want to go back there I was young and I was fit and I was dumb amen <laughs> you didn't even know me back then but I was dumb and I'm not real bright now, but I, I, I can look back and I know I've grown and I've, I've learned some things. And things have changed. And I wish, boy, sometimes I wish we could, I wish we could change back the attitude towards church and Christians. I wish the world, I wish the world had the attitude towards pastors and towards churches they had back in the 50s. But we don't have that anymore. And it's not just the world's fault. 
it's church's fault. A lot of pastors have done some dumb things over the years and messed things up and hurt Christians and hurt the viewpoint of churches. And a lot of, a lot of Christians have tried to, to, to have their foot in both camps and, and try to claim to be a Christian and, and, and they've tried to live like the world. And, 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 and our world has changed as well. And, and, and certainly there's been a lot of different aspects that have, that have caused these changes in our world today. But we can't go back. We can't change that. But God can use us right here and now because we're serving Him. We're not serving this world and we're not serving ourselves. Their ministry was to God first and foremost. And when they remembered who they were serving, they also remembered what He can do. Because it's really, it's about what He can do, not what they can do. And let me remind you of this today as well. We say, well, the brakes have been put on in my life, and I've got health issues or financial issues, I've got work issues, I've got relationship issues, I've got the, the brakes have been put on in my life in all these various aspects. I can't do what I want to do. I can't do the things that, that I used to do. It doesn't mean God can't still do something. It doesn't mean God's done. It doesn't mean God does not have the power and the ability. And, and, and I love the 13th Psalm. And, and you really ought to, you, you ought to go to this passage right here. In Psalms chapter number 13, you ought to underline uh, this whole, you ought to highlight or underline this whole thing. You ought to just maybe make a copy of this and, and have it with you. When things look dark, it's a very short psalm. Just six verses. But when things are difficult, look at what the psalmist says. Look at what David writes here. In Psalm chapter number 13, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel of my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How shall uh, mine enemy be exalted? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest mine enemy say I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. And here's just an honest, here's just an honest, heartfelt prayer from David. And he's, and he's wondering, God, have you forgotten about me? Have you hidden yourself from me? Are you, why are you letting my enemies prevail over me? And it's just an honest, heartfelt prayer and, and, and pouring out his heart to God. And here's the truth, and I shared this a couple weeks ago. I heard this, and boy, I'll tell you, it really, it's, a, it's a great way of phrasing this. God can handle our honest questions. He's big enough and smart enough. He can handle our feelings. He can handle our emotions, but I think honesty needs to be a part of our, our relationship with God. Here's David just being honest. I think I'm going to die, God. I think, I, think my, I think my enemies are going to be able to say they've triumphed over me. And he pours out his heart to God. But then look at what he says in verse number 5. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. In the midst of his anguish, in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his loss, he, he thinks he's at death's door, but yet he can look back and say, no, 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 I trusted in God. I'm going to believe he's going to deal bountifully, bountifully with me. I know God has blessed me in the past, so right here in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of the hurting, I'm going to sing to God. That's David's, that's David's commitment there. Even though he's suffering, even though he's in anguish, he's going to sing anyways. Just like Paul and Silas sitting in that prison cell. They were going to sing anyway. They weren't going to stop. David looks back and he goes, God has dealt bountifully with me. I know he's done good things in the past. I know he can do good things in the future. And so right here and now, I'm going to sing praise to him. And I'll tell you something, folks. Christians, if singing and Christian music is not a part of our lives, not only are we in disobedience to God, but we're missing out on a key element that's going to help to encourage us and to strengthen us spiritually. And when things look dark, we need to sing. When we're at a loss, we need to sing. Singing should be a daily part of our lives. We know that God included a whole book of songs. The book of Psalms is a book of songs. He included that in the Bible. Jesus made singing a part of the church at the Last Supper. There, they sang a hymn together. And it's been commanded throughout Scripture for Paul and Silas. It was a comfort. 
for them in the midst in, in the midst of their in, in, in the midst of their suffering and pain. But it was more than just a comfort for them. It was a testimony to others as well. They didn't stop their singing. They didn't stop their praising. They didn't stop exalting God. And I know some can't sing. Some can't sing well. And some just can't sing. I was talking to one member and, and their voice just isn't strong enough. And, and uh, so I, I, you know, and, and this person was telling me they can't sing you know, four hymns and all the verses in worship. It just wears them out. So I offered to give them you know, a, a list of the songs we're going to sing so they can save up their voice for the ones they like the best. We may not be able to sing. Our singing may not be, it's a joyful noise, amen, but it may not be a testimony, but music needs to be included. Good, godly Christian music needs to be a part of our lives. And praise to God needs to be a part of our lives, whether it's set to music or not. They didn't stop their singing. They couldn't do much else. But they could sing and they could pray. They could give God praise. And they let God do the shaking. They let God shake the prison. They let God shake the doors. Look at what happens next in verse number 26. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm for we are all here. Here's what happened. and I want you to, I want you to understand this. There were breaks put on their ministry. They could not continue to go into town every day and preach. They could not continue to go out and witness to many people. They could not continue what they had started there in the church of Philippi. But it didn't mean they quit. They did everything they could, even within the limitations that they had. And they gave the rest of it to the Father. They trusted the rest of the burdens and the cares and the worries. They trusted that into God's hands. What they could not do, they let God do. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. What a wonderful... And I wonder, when Paul wrote these words uh, to the church in Philippi, if he wasn't thinking about that night he spent in the Philippian jail there, when he says there, he says in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Because that's what they did. I mean, they... They, they, they sang praises to God and they laid their burdens in prayer at His feet and they did all that they could do there and then what happened next was that the peace of God that passes all understanding came upon them and it kept their hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I can't help but wonder if Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, wasn't thinking about his night in that dark Philippian jail where he sang praises and he gave his burdens to the Lord and gave thanksgiving to God uh, and, and then the peace of God covered him and Silas that night. They didn't try to force their way out. They, didn't, they, they weren't under duress to escape. They gave their cares to God. And they let God do the rest. It doesn't mean they did nothing. They did what they could. But God gave them peace and God gave them confidence and God used them when, when seemingly they could no longer be used. You see, they were consistent in their faith. You know, the old saying is, <laughs> William Shakespeare said it, consistency, thou art a jewel. Faithfulness, consistency, it, it's, it's a rare and valuable thing. But they were consistent. I said before, it's easy to sing when the sun's shining and, and there's money in the bank and food in your belly and, and everything's going right in the world. It's easy to sing. But when you're beat up and locked up, 
it's hard to sing, but that's when we need to choose faithfulness and consistency. That's when we need to be consistent. When our faith is tested, when we're challenged, that's when we need to step up and continue to serve, continue to keep Christ first, continue to do His work and His will. Here's this idea of just trusting God with the situation. Continue to do what you know is right. I, I know sometimes we have frustration. I know you might have passed out a thousand tracks in your lifetime. And you wonder, boy, when is someone going to get saved? When is someone going to come to church? You, you might have been praying for decades for that lost family member or friend. And you keep wondering, when, when are they going to get saved? Can I tell you something, folks? In our faithfulness, in our consistency, God blesses. And when things are difficult for us, that's especially the time for us to be found faithful. The Bible says in James 2, verses 15 and 17, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Our faith, if it does not prove itself, if it is not evident in times of doubt, in times of fear, in times of want or need, it's not real, it's not genuine. Faith requires action. It needs to be consistent. And they let God do the shaking, and they trusted God. They gave their cares to the Father. And what happened was they saw God save souls. I said they let God do the shaking. That earthquake came. The doors sprung open. The, everyone's bands were loose. That's a unique kind of earthquake right there. It made the chains fall off their, their hands and their feet. But that's what happened. And, 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 and then when the, 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 the keeper of the prison, he jumps in. He sees the doors open. He sees the loose chains on the floor. And he thinks, boy, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm responsible. He was going to take his own life because he was responsible for the lives of these prisoners. And Paul's response in verse number 28 was, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And the Bible says in verse number 29, Then when he called for a light and sprang in, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. Here's the wonderful thing. Their singing had an impact. Here they were. And, and maybe they sang in desperation. Maybe they sang because there was nothing else to do. Maybe they sang just because they couldn't sleep that night. But they chose to be faithful. They chose to think of God. God first and foremost, and so they sang, and their singing had an impact. I don't know what they sang. They might have sang Psalms 13. It wouldn't surprise me. But they sang. And the Bible said there in verse number 25 that all the prisoners heard them, and in verse number 28, Paul was able to say, we are all here. Not a single one of these prisoners fled. None of them ran. They're here. Because they heard the message. And it changed their lives. It changed their hearts. It changed their decisions. The testimony that we have is more than a t-shirt. It's more than a bumper sticker. It's more than just the words that we say. It's what people see, and ex see exhibited in our lives in the darkest and worst of times. In the midst of our adversity, in the midst of our problems, in the midst of our pain, that is when people are going to look and examine our faith. And Paul and Silas, because of their consistency, they sang in the midst of the darkness. Their singing had an impact that otherwise they, they could never have had. Their ministry in Philippi up to this point had just been a little bit of a struggle. Not a whole lot had been going on. 
But now all of a sudden you've got this group of prisoners adhering and listening. Now all of a sudden you've got this jailer. When he recognizes the fact that they did not flee, and, and I would hope that maybe he heard the singing or the prayers, but for sure he saw, maybe he didn't hear, but he for sure saw the fact that they did not try to run away and that they literally saved his life. The first words recorded from him is, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I want what you've got. I want the hope and the peace that you have. I want the strength of God in my life the way it's in your life. And what happens is the Savior gives the increase. Paul and Silas, their faithfulness, God used it and God reaped the reward. God saved that man's soul that day. He asked, well, he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they were able to speak up and say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Trust in Jesus Christ to save you. And you can be saved. And Jesus Christ saved him that day. Him and his whole household got saved. Him and his whole household got baptized. And let me tell you something, folks. Once you're saved, once you're born again, the next step is baptism to make public your profession of faith, to make public the fact that you're walking in the newness of life. You were dead and now you're alive. To make public the fact that Jesus died and rose again uh, from the grave for you. And, and, and we share this publicly. What's happened on the inside, we share it on the outside. And that's what happens here. And I'll tell you what, the ministry in Philippi, it turns around not because of their plans and not because of their organization and not because of their, their street preaching, but because God used them in darkness and in pain and in adversity and they continued to minister and God blessed that. And souls were saved. And, and that family was baptized. And then we find that this church is going to be established. Because God used them in the darkest of times. In the most difficult of times. Later on, the Apostle Paul would find himself in prison again, nearing the end of his life, at a time when he would not be found free. But in Colossians chapter number 4, we have the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Colossae. This, if you will, prayer request, this command... Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, the Apostle Paul writes, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Here's the Apostle Paul. He's writing, he is in bonds. He's in prison in Rome. And he writes this letter and he commands them to continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Once again, I just think it's a reflection. I think it's a lesson he learned in prison. It's to pray and to be thankful. To pray and to praise in the darkest of times. And so he commands the church to continue to pray with thanksgiving. And he says this, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I might make it manifest as I ought to speak. You know what his prayer request is to the church in Colossae? Not that God would open up the doors, not that God would shake the chains off, but that God would use him to be able to share hope and light with somebody, even in prison. Because Paul learned many years before that even in a dark prison cell, God can use a testimony. God can use some praise. God can use some singing. God can use a prayer. God can use you in the darkest and worst of times. You feel like there's nothing you can do. That may be the time where God uses you the most. And so at the end of his life, Paul, again in jail, again in prison, he says, I want to see this happen again. I want to see God save souls from this jail cell. Please pray that God would give me the right words to speak. In the midst of his adversity, of his pain and his struggling, pray for me that souls would be saved. Because he loves God first and foremost. He loves others secondarily, and, and his needs are in last place. 
Folks, souls can still be saved. We can still send more missionaries around the world. We can still see revival in our church and, and, and in this world around us. It starts with a prayer. Would we pray for souls? As, as we continue to praise God, would you choose to exalt Him? And I know there's pain, I know there's suffering, I know there's difficulty, but would you choose to exalt Christ and praise Him and lift Him up, not just personally to yourself, but so others can hear? And would you trust God with the things you can't handle? Lay those burdens at His feet. And let God, let God bring the increase. You do what you can do. God will do the rest. God will do the rest.